Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Tonight we have Maria Medina Milner. She is the second vice president, community relations and equity and inclusion for the League of Women Voters of the Austin area. She was previously director of equity and inclusion for the League of Women Voters Austin area for the past two years. This coming 2020, 2021 league year will be her first as second VP. We're very excited to have her tonight. Welcome Maria. Uh, good evening, thank you all for joining us tonight on the 101st anniversary of Congress's approval of the Women's Suffrage Amendment, most commonly known as the 19th Amendment. The approval was passed by joint resolution and sent to the states for ratification. The House of Representatives had voted 304 to 89 and the Senate 56 to 25 in favor of the amendment. So before we start, I have an activity I'd like for all of us to try. I know that we're not able to see each other right now, so we're going to go ahead and try and do this uh, according to the honor system and just use your own knowledge. So, so it's a group exercise. If everybody can just try and name five women suffragists or suffragettes, you don't have to do this in the chat. Just just try to come up with five women uh, suffragists and or suffragette, suffragettes. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. How many of those uh, that you listed were black suffragettes? Anyone that was Latinx or indigenous? Any Asian suffragettes? Any men? What were their names? You might remember their faces, but what were their names? If you felt like you were drawing blanks now, you're not alone. When it comes to the suffragette movement, a lot of us are taught over and over again the names of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And it becomes so commonplace for us that sometimes we fall into the lull of repetition and we don't stop to ask ourselves if there are other faces, other names, other voices that we should know. So the history of exclusion of voices in the fabric of suffrage history is a long and deep one. Uh, sorry, that was repetitive. Today, in honor of truth, racial healing and reconciliation on the 101st anniversary of the congressional approval of the 19th Amendment, we're going to look at the history of exclusion in the suffragette movement. The beginning of the suffragette movement is actually deeply tied to the abolitionist movement. So what happened? How can a movement so tied to the abolition of slavery be void of African American women's involvement? Spoiler, African American women were definitely there and we will learn and remember the names of those suffragettes and the suffragists that the dominant culture is how we will refer to it, but really the narrative that uh, white culture tends to dictate for our country has worked so hard to erase. So here's a brief presentation outline that I understand doesn't look very brief. For those of you who'd like a reference point for the presentation portion of today, we're going to start with a bare bones, lightning speed history of the suffragette movement, followed by some information on four of the many white suffragettes that our shared US history reveres as the champions of the suffrage movement. Then we will follow with a look at why black and white suffragettes parted ways. We'll then le learn or relearn, depending on your historical knowledge, about four amazing black suffragettes followed uh, by some more information regarding one of them um, and their establishment of the National Association of Colored Women's Club. We'll round out the presentation portion with the names and accomplishment, accomplishments of more suffragettes and suffragists that the dominant history continues to erase and end on why the manner in which we remember history matters. So a brief history. Let's begin with a very, very brief history of the suffragette movement from Seneca Falls to 1920. In July of 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention held in Seneca Falls, New York, was the first convention held in the United States on the subject of suffrage. That is to say that it was the first convention held on the sub subject of white women's suffrage because only middle upper class white women, white men who supported their suffrage, and Frederick Douglass were in attendance. No black women had been invited to, the attend, to attend. In 1851, Sojourner Truth was asked to speak at a suffrage convention in Akron, Ohio. A speech so moving, but that was so distorted in order to create an image of mistruth 
that would become her legacy as written by dominant history writers. But more on that later. In 1868, we saw the national ratification of the 14th Amendment, in which freed peoples who had been born as slaves were now, without a shadow of a doubt, being identified as full citizens of the United States. The ratification of the 14th Amendment fomented feel the feelings of resentment and jealousy in white suffragettes that black men would be granted the right to vote before white women. Then in 1869, the law made it clear that black men would be able to vote with the passage of the 15th Amendment. It is at this point that the suffragette movement's already fragile inclusivity finishes falling apart. The resentment of white suffragettes to the passage of the 15th Amendment was made evident through the dissolution of the American Equal Rights Association, or ERA, an organization committed to the, quote, securing uh, equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex, end quote. The dissolution of ERA gave way to two organizations, the Woman Exclusive National Women's Suffrage Association, or NWSA, founded by Stanton and Anthony, and the American Woman Suffrage Association, the AWSA, which was considered the conservative of the two factions as they still kept men and abolitionists among their ranks. After about 20 years of being separated, both the NWSA and the AWSA merged to form the National American Women Suffrage Association, also known as uh, NASA. This was done in order to combine forces and push as many state amendments of women's suffrage as possible in order to force Congress to have to pass a federal amendment doing the same. In 1900, NASA began their, quote, society plan, end quote, an effort to recruit college-educated, privileged, and politically influential members and to broaden its educational efforts. Again, black suffragettes, suffragettes were left out of the process. But that didn't stop black suffragettes from forming their own women's clubs. And in July of 1896, the first annual convention of the National Federation of Afro-American Women was held in DC. By the end of the convention, the establishment of the National Association of Colored Women was born. And when it incorporated in 1904, it became known as the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, or the NACW. The newly formed NACW would not only tackle issues of suffrage, but also very deeply dive into community work, challenge stereotypes of black people, and increase public awareness of racial segregation, of disenfranchisement, and of racial violence. Finally, in the history of the suffragette movement on August 18th of 1920, the 19th Amendment, which granted the right of citizens to vote without denial or abridge, quote, by the United States or by any state on account of sex, end quote, was passed. So our shared United States history would have us know, without a shadow of a doubt, that the following four women were pivotal in establishing suffrage for all women. Seemingly larger than life, Susan B. Anthony is so renowned that her likeness spent a total of four years being minted and countless more in circulation. Elizabeth Cady Stanton authored the Declaration of Sentiments and along with Lucretia Mott, founded the first women's right con rights convention in Seneca Falls after being angered at being excluded at the world's anti-slavery convention in London in 1840 for being women. As previously stated, Lucretia Mott was a co-founder of the Seneca Falls Convention alongside Stanton, and in 1866 became the president of the American Equal Rights Association. Lucy Stone was the founder of the American Women's Suffrage Association. A longtime collaborator with Anthony and Stanton, she was a staunch supporter of abolition and split with them over their outrage of the passage of the 15th Amendment. These four, and honestly, primarily the first two women, are endlessly the faces of the suffragette movement, as many of us are taught from an early age. This education was not an accident. Such was the ire of Anthony and Stanton at the passage of the 15th Amendment 
that the six-volume series, The History of Women's Suffrage, which chronicles the movement from 1881 to 1922 and serves to this day as the major source of primary documents on the suffrage movement. It was produced by Santon Anthony, Matilda, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Ida Hussard Harper, and it bears no mention of the blackness of the very black suffragettes, or very few black suffragettes they included. How can a society be educated in the collaborative work necessary to push forward the 19th Amendment when history writers continue to colorblind the audience? It is no accident that we know the names of these four women so well. This is a quote from Ms. Stanton. This is not the portrait of the suffragette of Stanton that we're so often presented. And yet, this is part and parcel historically Stanton. Both Stanton and Anthony became known, known allies of one George Francis Train, a Democrat who supported slavery. During his first run for president with the motto, women first, Negro last. Another white suffragette, an 11-year president of the National American Women Suffrage Association, or NASA, Anna Howard Shaw is quoted as saying, you have put the ballot in the hands of your black men, thus making them political superiors of white women. Never before in the history of the world have men made former slaves political masters of their former mistresses. So how did it come to this? The roots of suffrage had previously been deeply entwined with abolitionism. So what happened? It came down to the difference between personal liberation and collective liberation. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other women like them made it abundantly clear that they would throw the idea of collective liberation through suffrage away if it remotely threatened any chance they had at a personal shot at suffrage for themselves. If their reaction to the passage of the 14th Amendment didn't make that fact painfully clear, their follow-up reaction to the 15th Amendment made sure of it. As stated previously, Stanton and Anthony had already begun to stump with George Train, a man whose campaign motto was, again, women first, Negro less. They knew it wasn't all women first, but only white women. Their one-track mind for personal liberation betrayed the collective goal that black suffragettes and other white suffragettes still work towards. Many of the arguments made for the suffrage of white women were made on the basis of class and education. Stanton and Anthony most strongly argued that women, with the implication that the women they spoke for were white women, were better suited than black men to vote because their proximity to affluence and education made them better informed citizens somehow. By taking into their own hands that definition of woman, they could and did effectively erase all other images of women, especially women of the global majority. Ultimately, all of these actions were steeped in and perpetuated the systemic ingrained racism that has always existed in the United States. This is noticeably evident in a quote by Rebecca Ann Latimer Felton, the first woman to serve in the Senate. Quote, I do not want to see a Negro man walk to the polls and vote on who should handle my tax money, while I myself cannot vote at all. When there is not enough religion in the pulpit to organize a crusade against sin, nor justice in the courthouse to promptly punish crime, nor manhood enough in the nation to put a sheltering arm about innocence and virtue, if it needs lynching to protect women's dearest possession from the ravening human beast, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary." End quote. These attitudes, this history, is why I titled the slide, White Suffragettes Part Ways with Black Suffragettes. I want to make clear that those white suffragettes that left the American Equal Rights Association on account of the passage of the 15th Amendment left black suffragettes. Let the history show that black suffragettes were always present, and more than that, that they fought for the collective liberation and equity of all women, even when they were actively pushed aside.
we have to call out our education of the suffrage movement. We need to ask ourselves whose voices have been missing in order to set the path for, to reintroducing their names regularly into our society. Women like Ida B. Wells, one of the founders of the NAACP, women's rights activists for all women, anti-segregation activists, and anti-lynching activists. Born a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi, she saw the potential in having black women become voters and active participants in the political system. Such was the commitment of some black suffragettes that they were willing to be members of the National Women's Suffrage Association in spite of Stanton and Anthony's betrayal of black suffragettes. Women like Harriet Horton Purvis, one of the coordinators of the fifth National Women's Rights Convention and founder of the first biracial women's abolitionist group the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. We need to look at women like Sojourner Truth in her truth and not the one crafted by white suffragette who made a caricature of her and her now infamous Ain't I a Woman speech. It was a speech so riveting where she implored the attendees to consider her own shared identity and womanhood that its delivery was reappropriated in order to paint a perception of a woman who was militant, militant and black. We need to know the contributions of women like Mary Church Terrell, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women's Club. This quote is from the National Women's History Museum biography entry on Terrell. Her words, lifting as we climb, became the motto of the National Association of Colored Women, the NACW, the group she helped found in 1896. She was NACW president from 1896 to 1901. African American women eager to become active collaborators in the suffrage movement, and yet in the 1913 women's suffrage procession, they were relegated to the back of the parade, save for one very passionate Ida B. Wells. And it, it is that rhetoric that oppressive rejection that makes the celebration of the passage of the 19th, uh, 19th Amendment feel hollow for women of the global majority. The 19th Amendment did not grant the power to vote to all women, and how we perpetuate that idea distorts how we see its outcome. Had black suffragettes been included in all their glory in the suffragette movement, Frances E.W. Harper considered, quote, the mother of African-American journalism, end quote, and co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women in 1894, could have done more to advocate the rights of all women before her death in 1911. If the 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments had been successful in protecting the votes of black men and women in their passages, there would have been no need for Mary McLeod Bethune to found the National Council of Negro Women in 1935 and worked twice as hard for a quarter of the victories in registering black women to vote. If these amendments had been as successful in granting suffrage to black women at the age of 25 in 1937, Dorothy Height could have gone farther in advancing equity and justice in voter education than she was able to do in her lifetime. And Fannie Lou Hamer would not have needed to give a testimony so powerful it scared LBJ into giving an impromptu press conference just to cut the broadcast of her testimony off, a portion of which I will read now. I was in jail when Medgar Evers was murdered. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave? Will we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? If the 19th Amendment had been truly successful at granting all women the right to vote, there would have been no need for the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and its amendment in 1975 to enfranchise black women and other women of the global majority. White suffragettes who had fought so hard for the enfranchisement of their own women to the point of denying black suffragettes the ability to participate alongside them ultimately had nothing to fear in the face of the Jim Crow era. 
Well, black suffragettes never, ever gave up the fight for all women. Much like black suffragettes have been erased from the dominant history narrative, we need to remember the men, and especially the black men, that history has forgotten. We need to remember again and again that Frederick Douglass was not only an abolitionist, but a staunch supporter of women's rights and suffrage. During the Seneca Falls Convention, Douglass petitioned in favor for women's suffrage. And of it, he said, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. His constant dismissal as a fierce supporter of women's suffrage comes from the mistaken notion that he was against women's suffrage if it came down to women's suffrage versus suffrage for black men. Douglas's pragmatism in the approach to suffrage for black men as a means of empowering black women and thus empowering women as a collective has been silenced by history if acknowledged at all. We need to learn the names of suffragettes of Asian heritage, like Mabel Pinghua Lee, who rode horseback as a teenager to campaign for women's suffrage and led Chinese and Chinese American women in a parade down Fifth Avenue in 1917 as a member of the Women's Political Equality League, and who, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, was unable to become a U.S. citizen when the 19th Amendment was passed. We need to know of indigenous Hawaiian women, such as Wilhelmina Kekelao Kalani Nui, Wiedemann Dowsett, and Elizabeth Kahanu Kaawai Kalani Na Ole Woods, Ole Woods, Kekelao Alani Nui, established the first women's suffrage club in 1912 in the territory of Hawaii and actively campaigned for the right of women to vote before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Kahanu Kauai Kalanai Na Aole was another prominent Hawaiian suffragette, but whose information I found was in very short supply. And we need to know of Jovi Teaviar, founder of La Liga Femenil Mexicanista. Much like Ida B. Wells, Izara was outspoken on the lynchings of Mexican men in her community. Her work as an advocate for the better education of Mexican-American children and her anti-lynching reporting fueled her passion for politics and women's suffrage. Izara believed if you could educate a woman and you educate a family. So how we remember history matters because our histories were not made in vacuum. They are not histories made by one-dimensional figures, even when those that came before us want to paint a very different picture. For all the lives that we are encouraged to remember in reverence, we are often asked to forget many more because these stories of those people, in quotes, don't fit the narrative of the U.S. as a country that was able to take on its ugliness and overcome it all. We need to ask ourselves, who do we remember in the history of the suffrage movement? Who do we forget? What does that mean for how we gain that knowledge? What does it mean for how we seek knowledge? Where do we go with this information now that we know better? And why does this all matter? So at this point, uh, we would have the discussion portion of the event. So with the scope of this history and these questions in mind, what can we learn and what do we need to ask ourselves about the history of exclusion that has led our a perception of the women's suffrage movement? So any final thoughts? So we've got a question from Lydia. She says, where do we go from here? Um, that's a great question. Um, genuinely, uh, especially given our moment uh, right now in history, we uh, learn more. We, um, we do better by learning more. We look into the suffragists that 
maybe in this presentation you hadn't heard of. Um, and, and you can go even further by um, asking what representation looks like now. So it just kind of depends on, on where you're at and where you'd like to be. Uh, there's a great podcast uh, that, that the League of Women Voters uh, in one of our local leagues actually puts out called What Would Alice Paul Do? And it's a podcast generally about uh, what do we do at this point when it comes to um, incorporating voting rights and working with other communities and or where do we work on when it comes to voting rights in this day and age? What would Alice Paul do? Um, so yeah. It, it just it depends on where you're at in terms of learning and where you would like to go. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, definitely, we should have them more in our birthday calendars uh, at the league. Okay, so Courtney is asking, uh, I teach middle school history, eighth grade US and seventh grade Texas. I try my best to include unheard voices in my class but no true change can come into education until there is change at the level of curriculum development. So what specifically can we do to influence the curriculum that is required? That is um, definitely a very interesting question. I, at this point, I'd always tell folks that they can uh, contact the Texas Education Agency. I know it's different, especially as a, his, as a teacher, um, where you might stand on that. But I think also getting uh, I'm a big proponent of getting your school's PTA involved. Um, so if there is a way that you can work with your school's PTA regarding um, maybe celebrating a history day and really trying to encourage um, that participation level to help, uh, you know, expand how we have these discussions in our school system. Um, you can. I, I'm not really sure what else you can do in your school specifically, uh, but definitely talking to your local league or a league in your area uh, and asking them how you can maybe add some more to your curriculum might be a great start. Cheryl Lawrence is asking, uh, in your slideshow you listed 1919 as passage of the voting rights bill for women, but when you spoke you said it was 1920. Why the disparity? That was a a uh, numerical mistake on my part, uh, the, the uh, Congress, um, like I had said before, Congress approved by joint resolution the 19th Amendment today in 1919, but the ratification of the amendment didn't happen until August 18th. They had to send the, the law out to different states to, for them to ratify it. Um, and so that's why you didn't see ratification until a year later in August. So Lydia is asking, how do we educate others and how do we change the written history? Uh, we educate others first by educating ourselves. Um, I, a rule of thumb that was given to me a long time ago was, if you can explain it well enough to teach it, then, then that's exactly where you go. Um, you start with that first, and that requires a lot of reading and real interest in that. Um, the Texas Historical Association of our state has, um, I think it's THSA is the, the acronym for it, Texas Historical State Association, and they have a fantastic website on women's history in Texas, and there are plenty of uh, women's histories that you can read in their biographies. Um, so I would start there. I would also continue with the National Women's History Museum. They have, uh, as mentioned in the, in the presentation, they have um, an amazing trove of biographies on women uh, who have made massive influence, uh, have had massive influence in our society. Um, and really, um, you, can, you can start by uh, typing in National Association of Colored Women's Clubs you can uh, Google Ida B. Wells. You can Google Mary Church Terrell. They're fantastic for start. Um, if nothing else, I know a lot of people kind of uh, frown on Wikipedia, but the thing about Wikipedia is that you actually have to have sources within their, uh, their article to, to cite. So if you're not looking at Wikipedia, go down to their source selection, uh, see what, what references an article has, and go from there. Um, but there are 
definitely a lot of books. Uh, I was just listening to a podcast called Sincerely Letty. That's L E T T I E. Um, and she talked. To, she was talking about how uh, about women's suffrage um, specifically. Uh, she put this podcast out in March, and she was discussing how she felt as a young black woman regarding um, how these these women that we do revere, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in particular, are not her heroes uh, because they can't be for her. So. Um, I would, yeah, definitely look it up. Uh, podcasts are a great resource. Um, the National Women's History Museum, I can't stress that enough, and the Texas Historical uh, State Historical Association. So um, they have an entire website dedicated to women's history. Oh, and I also see also at the National Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C. There are lots of exhibits of famous black women who were civil rights, suffra civil rights and suffragists. Um, and thank you, Cheryl Lawrence, for that recommendation. Uh, she's absolutely right. And in COVID right now, a lot of our museums at the national level, even some state museums, are opening up their museum for virtual tours. So please do take advantage of that. And I, I want to plug in uh, Pluderville Library and all of our local libraries have information on women's suffragists. So uh, both suffragettes and suffragists. And so please do take advantage of your local library and uh, kind of spend some time doing uh, a search and just seeing what kind of books are available for that might be accessible for you now. Yep. Yes. yes, Cheryl, the local library is awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, so every March for Women's History Month, we put up a book list. So I'm not sure if it's live now because it's a few months later, but I will make it live and then I will send you a link. So, and it'll links to the catalog so you can put things on reserve if you need to. I also want to recommend uh, the League of Women Voters of the Nashville area has a fantastic online page uh, or site page um, that is dedicated to black suffragettes. And so if you get a chance, please go to the LWV Nashville site. Um, we're working on it here in the Austin area, uh, but we got a lot of catching up to do. All right. I just want to make a point to say that I moved it into the last slide. If you'd like to get in touch with the LWVAA, uh, with myself in particular, is my email. If you're looking to just contact um, LWV Austin, it's LWV Austin at LWVAustin.org. And we have a question from Alina. Uh, do you have any books that you recommend that tell a good history of the suffrage movement? Um, I always do, and I always blank out on this one. So if you give me a moment, I will definitely pull up my list. Uh, okay. I'm more of a podcast listener these days, so it's been kind of hard to keep everything steady. We did just get one in last year, um, and it's just called the Women's Suffrage Movement, um, but it goes over the whole history, and it has uh, some of the people that were mentioned in the presentation, uh, and that was in our Women's History Month book list for this year, so that will be included um, in the link that I'll send you all, as well as some others. Um, um, there's a book called One Woman, One Vote, Rediscovering the Women's Suffrage Movement. Um, that is supposed to be a companion book to a PBS series that came out of the same name. Um, so I'd highly recommend checking it out. A lot of, a lot of books tend to have um, either short essays, if they're a, like when they're compendiums, they're compendiums of short essays or <laughs> biographical kind of writing on, on women and women's suffrage. There's another one, and I will remember, I promise, after I hang up, because that's how, I, that's how it happened. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's called when, Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. That is, that is another one, and that one is a collection of different women um, who that book kind of highlights. And we have that book. Great. <laughs> All right. I don't see
see any more questions. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Fully River Library, for uh, hosting us. Um, I do want to plug our next uh, League of Women Voters of the Austin Area Equity and Inclusion event. Will be a discuss discussion in July, making gay history. The uh, the podcast. We'll be listening to the podcast, and then we will also be um, uh, discussing it afterwards. So hopefully you'll do that listening ahead of time. Uh, so Saturday, July 25th at 12:30 p.m. You can find the podcast at makinggayhistory.com, and you can find the event info on our lead calendar at lwbaustin.org. All right.